We all image our creator, a divine spark clothed in frail, beautiful flesh. We're already but not yet people offered abundant life, but tasting it in only small spoonfuls. Yet glory shines through. The veil is torn when a newborn baby is first born. When a woman welcomes an outcast boy. When a little girl laughs freely, full of joy. When a young man gives a smile to a stranger. When a young woman rescues another amidst danger. When a grandmother volunteers to feed someone in need. When a grandfather plants a tiny seed of hope. Life is messy, flawed, yet sacred. A gift to be reopened with each new sunrise. Precious at birth. When clothed in wrinkles and through all the mountains and valleys in between. Each living created thing. Floppy-eared dogs, majestic lions, exotic birds, cherry blossoms, gliding sea turtles. And you are good, just as God declared. All of life comes from the Creator, and it's so very good and beautiful and sacred, waiting with all of creation for our redemption to be complete. Batteries not included. Yeah. Well, good morning. good morning. I love that intro video. How about you? You know, you are special. You have been created in the image of God. Uh, it is a flawed, you know, replication of who God is and who God has uh, died in Jesus Christ for us to become. But you are precious. Uh, just the way you are, and God loves you so much, he's not going to leave you the way you are. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope you all got one of these... Uh, little reminder uh, bands, Who Am I? And that begins really in the Genesis account of creation. God created a man in his own image, male and female, he created them. So turn to your neighbor and say, I am God's child. I am God's child. All right, and with that, let's begin our worship time together. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, make sure you get a coffee mug. We like to make sure we mug our visitors. It's just a way of creating a memory for you, quite honestly. Uh, the Connect card, make sure you fill that out, and your name is printed legibly, so when I go through them during the week, I can lift the right person up in prayer when I get to your card, okay? And anything specific, uh, joy or concern you'd like me to add to my prayers for you this week, put that on the back. Uh, would you just bow your, your heads with me, and let's, let's uh, prepare our hearts for worship. Heavenly Father, we come into this place knowing, at least at some level, who we are. We know we're not our neighbor. We know we're not our parents or our kids. We know we're not the stranger down the street. So we have a sense of who we are, but so many times the world has marred that image. So many times our own actions or inactions have, have uh, called into question who we really are. So Father, in these moments that we have together this morning, as brief as they are, through word, through prayer, through um, music and laughter and moments where we're called to think, maybe for the first time on a subject ever in our life. Father, we simply ask you to make these moments sacred, to make them set aside for you to talk to us in a way that will make us a better representation of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of life, the, the secondary gifts of laughter and love and just joy. Give us all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, amen. 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 Would you please stand and, and uh, sing with us, hear our praises.
uh, you may be seated as uh, we experience our call to worship. Who is leading us? I am. <laughs> it's always good to know. Reminds me of a time I went to uh, a retirement party for a staff person that I led at uh, Trinity uh, decades before, and they asked me to come, and I just thought it was an invitation to come. I showed up in the hall filled with people, and they said, uh, so don't forget, you come on after, and I go, for what? He said, you're the keynote, and I go, really? How long do you expect me to talk? Oh, no more than 10 minutes, and I'm like, huh. So I had to run over and, and make some notes and notes and notes, and it was a blast. Don't you, just, don't you just love to praise people in public? Amen. I hope you raise your kids that way to where, you know, your neighbors were sick and tired of hearing how great your kids were, you know. I do that with you. I hope you do that with me, just asking for a friend, okay. But call to worship a psalm 8. Remain seated. The Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of us, human beings that you care for us? You have made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. You made us rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under our feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the ocean. Lord, our Lord, this is all of us. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the... Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. So let it be. Now, if you would stand again and join us in singing, Who am I? Who am I?
guys sound really good. You must believe what you're singing. Give God the glory. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, and you can go ahead and be seated. We'll have our congregational and Lord's Prayer. That's not me too, is it? <laughs> Who's doing it? <laughs> you know, I don't like one-man dog and pony shows. It gets a little old. Does anybody feel led? Anybody? Linda? No. Next time. Next time I'll put you on the spot. Anybody else want to be on the spot? I'm always willing to pray for us. Anybody else want to? You hear me all the time. Okay, you came to church to be a passive observer. Great! I thought you came to worship to like let Jesus spill out onto the world. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence aware that not everybody knows that you're everywhere. There's no place above the earth, on the earth, or below the earth. There's no situation we find ourselves in uh, that you are not there, that you're not pressing in on our conscience and trying to remind us just who we are, that you're not pressing in against our heart and our soul, reminding us that we were created in your image. So, Father, some of us have come in here, and we're just excited to be alive. Others have come in here, and we wonder if we are still alive. So, Father, into this mix, we ask you to stir in your spirit, the Holy Spirit, to remind us that our life is not our own. Once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then our life has purpose and meaning. That all the things that the world tries to do to us and gets away with doing to us are put in a new context, a context of love and grace and mercy. And the wiles, the arrows of Satan that are meant to harm us, in fact, become trophies of your grace. And we become victors who share exactly how you, through the, your power, living in us and living in your people, has gotten us through the dark nights of the soul. So, Father, I pray for those who are struggling right now. I ask you to encourage them. I ask you to let their brothers and sisters sitting here and around the world see them with eyes that know their pain. Hear them with ears that are not just limited to the sounds of this world, but to the sounds of the kingdom breaking forth in this world. Help us to see and hear in ways that draw us next to them and lift them up. It doesn't matter what nationality it is, they are. It doesn't matter what race they are, because there's just one human race. It doesn't matter whether they're in our socioeconomic schedule or class or above or below us. The truth is, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. The Christ came and died for each of us. If there was only one of us, he still would have come and had to do that because we were born to be victors, but we, don't, we were not born with the strength to overcome. So in Christ, lead us all to that moment of victory. And Father, we pray for the state of this world, not just with, oh, poor pitiful them, poor pitiful us, but with eyes and ears and a heart that says, I can make a difference. Maybe not for everyone, but for the one in front of me today. For the one that you're going to trust me enough to put in front of me tomorrow. Help me to see and hear them and touch them and remind them that you, Father God, don't make junk. Heal this world. Heal our hearts. And with our healed and healing hearts, help us to become the force that heals your world through your kingdom. Join me now in praying the prayer that asks all of this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, team. I think uh, you guys get a break, and I'm still in the soup. All right. Be careful on getting off the stage. Rhiannon was telling us this morning that somebody that works in the play production she's doing fell off the stage. Is that right, Rhiannon? And ended up breaking something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's doing better, right? Praise God. See, God has a catcher's mitt, you know? I know that if you think about it, uh, just for a minute, you'll remember times in your life where 
something didn't go the way you planned or something didn't go the way you wanted and, and God was right there. God touched you in such a way that it made a difference. This is going to be difficult because I don't have a slide advancer thing. Oh, there it is. All right. Can I get my slideshow up? That would help. So the question of the day is this, who am I? Who am I really? Last week we talked briefly about an internal thermostat, kind of queuing up this uh, series that we're going to be in for a while, maybe even through Easter. But don't worry, Easter comes really early this year. It's like in March, right? I'm like, wow. So Tuesday morning worship, we better start planning for Easter. Um, your internal thermostat. Loosely, that's the force that exists in each of us that governs our life and regulates our results. It happens for Christians and non-Christians, believers and non-believers. It's just the way life works because of who we are. If you walk into a room and it's too hot or too cold, you look for a what? Thermostat. So you can adjust the temperature to what you like. I remember my grandparents, we went, Lisa and I went to visit them and uh, they were older, probably a little older than me now, but anyway. Uh, but uh, my grandfather would get up and turn the thermostat up, and my grandmother would walk by and turn the thermostat. It was like watching Wimbledon, you know, just back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and the truth is, you know, we all have an internal thermostat. If it's 100 degrees outside and you set the thermostat to 75, the AC kicks on and cools the room to what temperature? 75, because the system is operating as it should. What if it's 30 degrees outside? In other words, you're up north. <laughs> you could adjust the thermostat, or you could just turn it off and get in the car and head to Florida. You know, but <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it's too hot or too cold. A, therm a thermostat regulates your life or the room based on your expectations. Your life. Think about it for just a minute. The areas where you feel like you're getting what you deserve, areas where you feel like you're not getting what you deserve, areas where you want more. If you're a 75 degree person, every time your results in any area of your life begins to exceed your identity, your unconscious expectations will cool your life back down to what you believe you deserve. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Because it's true for all of us, believers, non-believers. You have an identity that has been given to you by others and created by you with your experiences and your beliefs. But you do have an identity. Who am I? That's a very important question. And not just to reflect on, to fill a few minutes on a Sunday morning or a lazy Saturday afternoon, but who am I, really? Your identity regulates your internal self-worth. It just does, like it or not. Many are under the false assumption that external factors regulate your identity, your thermostat, who you believe you are. They, they believe that getting a promotion or getting married to the love of your life or getting a degree, getting the right car or the right house, they think all those things determine your identity. You know, I can uh, remember telling my son when he was considering getting his first car, <laughs> I can't use the exact phrase I gave him because I'm in church and I'm a pastor. And anyway, But he said, a car really is part of your identity. And so if you go out and buy a Chevette, it's going to determine a lot of your other decisions in your life and how people perceive you. But if you go out and buy a 68 Firebird, like your old man did, <laughs> then it'll drive parts. You know, I still think that's kind of true. What do you think? Is it true? I mean, you, what you buy kind of reflects your personality, though, doesn't it? How many of you would go out and buy a, uh, a beige laser suit with a mustard yellow shirt and a big, wide, flat brown tie? How many of you would buy that? 1978, I did. Look at my senior picture. <laughs> you look at pictures from the past and you realize who you thought you were at the time. It's just true. It is.
So hopefully I've kind of got you on the, the same page with me. I want you to consider what we've believed about who we are and what has set the thermostat in our identity. But Christians, we all know this to be true in this next verse, but I want you to understand that it's your absolute truth. It's the bedrock on which you stand. It is the foundation stone on which you build who you really are. Read it with me, would you? Genesis 1, 27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created him. So I don't know who you think you are. And in this world, it tries to confuse the issue. The truth is, you were either created a man or you were created a woman. You were created to reflect the image of God. It's in your DNA. You weren't created to be a rock or a cat or a cow or a billy goat. You were created to reflect God image. God's image as a man or a woman. And to a greater or lesser degree, that is true of who you are. But here's the deal. You can believe it, but not accept it. If you don't raise your identity to that level, all kinds of strange things will happen in your life. You'll think you deserve less than or more than someone else. You'll think that no matter how many advantages you have, you'll unconsciously need to turn the AC of your life back down to 75 degrees. When in fact, God created you for the abundant life. To live a life, not their life, not this life, but your life. Discovering all the gifts and talents, the things that trip your trigger and make you just go, I love this. For some of you, it's sharpening pencils. For others, it's climbing mountains. I don't know what yours is, but I suspect you do. And maybe after hearing this message, if you've forgotten who you are, Maybe you'll go out this week and discover it again. 75 degrees. That's what most of us operate at. It's not 30, but it's not 100. You see, you can acquire all the talents and skills and abilities you want. But until they align with your God-given identity, you're going to fall short of your goals. The goals that God set for you and the goals that you've set for yourself. Suppose you lose 20 pounds and a year later the weight is back and probably with a little more. Why do you suppose that happens? Why? This is true in every area, not just your fitness. But in this case, your fitness identity, your real thermostat, your, your self-identity, your awareness of who you are and who you expect to be, is set to 75 degrees. That means you're comfortable carrying 20 extra pounds. Oh, you'd never admit it to anybody else. You probably have trouble admitting it to the person that looks back to you from the bathroom mirror, but it's true. Somewhere, somebody said, this is who you are. You don't want to be there, but it's not your desires that adjust your thermostat. It's the determination to accept who you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am a child of God. So understand it's not just about the weight that the scale reports. It's the weight that your heart reports when you snap at others, when you're impatient, when you're unkind. When you choose to sit at home and do nothing instead of engaging a world that's hurt and broken in ways that only you can do. You know, we are better together. Each of us can do something that will make the world better for somebody else. And at the end of the day, guess what? It made it better for you, too. <sighs> you see, you do have a working identity, and it probably is less than what God has given you. It's sort of like this rubber band. I hope you all got one of these. It says, who am I? And then it ref reflects Genesis 127, which you uh, just read. I'm created in the image of God. But, you know, you can, in your own strength, stretch this rubber band, can't you? But what happens if you let go? Yeah, you snap back to what you were. And that happens in all these areas where we 
decide that we're going to be this or that. We buy the self-help. We join the gym. Uh, if you're smart, you only join one month at a time because you're probably going to last that long. So something has to happen other than a desire. These things happen financially, spiritually, relationally. Your thermostat, your self-identity eventually cools you off to what you believe you're worth. John 16.33. Read it with me, would you? I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Whose identity do we find peace? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Did he have trouble in his life? Oh, yeah. But he said, I have overcome this world. In this world you will have what? Trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In Christ, you don't use temporary setbacks as an excuse to create permanent failures. You have the grit that comes from the Holy Spirit to gravitate to where your thermostat is set because you have decided that you are a child of God, created in the image of God, meant to live the abundant life right now by seeing and serving a hurting world. Not just out there, but inside of you. Instead of burying your past, you let Christ resurrect it and redeem it. It's called forgiveness. So, so how do we realistically Adjust this thermostat. Create this new identity in Jesus Christ. Read the screen with me, would you? If I am a child of God, how do I adjust all areas of my life to reflect that reality? I'm going to give you three quick ones because it's a communion Sunday. The first one is faith. Keys to changing your identity, it starts in faith. Read Matthew 17 with me, would you? Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. It may be a weight goal. It may be a financial goal. It may be a relationship goal. Any personal goal that the Holy Spirit gives you can be achieved. Through the power of Christ. But here's what I know. It has to be God-honoring. You know the difference between the Dead Sea and the Red Sea? Or the, <laughs> the Galilean Sea? Uh, one takes in all the rains from the mountains around it. It comes in and it allows that blessing to pass out through the Jordan River. But at the end of the Jordan River, the same blessings that created life in the Sea of Galilee are just consumed. The water comes in, but it never goes out, so the salinity continues to rise until nothing can live there in the Dead Sea. That's why it's dead. Some of us have received blessing after blessing, year after year, and we've never yet joined in the flow of God's love to all of creation. You're not meant to be a sump. You're meant to be a spring of living water. Taking what God gives you and bubbling it out on this hurting world. Nothing moves mountains like faith. And you can name that mountain whatever you want. Whatever challenges you're facing right now. It could be your health, the health of a loved one. It could be a financial setback. It could be a car that just won't start. I don't know. You ever do that? You, you're, you're, why does it always happen when you're late somewhere? You can't get the car to start, you know? And then you pray. And then... Nine out of ten times it starts, and you thank you, Jesus, you still make house calls, you know. Nothing moves mountains like faith. That's where changing your thermostat, your identity, begins. As people of faith, fundamentally, we all believe God loves us. Do you believe God loves you? Yes. But the truth is, many of us aren't living like it. As a part of my faith, I believe that I come from the most extraordinary DNA in the world. God's DNA, and so do you. I don't believe God made me in His image to live with a thermostat set at 75 degrees. Alive but not alive. Getting by and getting through. God made you to make a difference. <laughs> 
right now, right in the middle of your life, not the ideal life, not the life you hope for, but the life you're living. God created us to live a faith-based life with a thermostat set at 100 degrees. Our identity is in Him. Our strength is in Him. Our hope is in Him. Many of us read the Bible. We go to church. We're kind-hearted and loving. But the truth is we don't extend the faith we profess into our fitness, our finance, or our relationships, or our business. So one of the keys to changing your identity, to getting your life back on track, to reflect the glory and honor of God and Jesus Christ, is to let faith move your mountains. Truth is, most of us are educated beyond our faithfulness. It's time to be faithful and to begin to believe that God loves you. He looks on your sin and he continues to love you. Then he lifts you up out of the miry muck that you've made and others have thrown on you. And he says, let me wash you off. Today's Communion Sunday. That's what communion does. <sighs> Let God and Jesus Christ move the mountains in your life. In every area of your life. The second thing is this. It's intentions. It's intentions. And there are some teachings out there that really aren't helpful when it comes to intentions. It begins in faith. That's the bedrock. But the first layer of stone, the first layer of brick, is intentions. You know, long before you build your first house, you intend to build your house. What happened if you have no intention to ever building a new house? What would happen? You'd never build a new house. You'd be satisfied with living in an apartment or something that somebody else built. But if you had your heart set on building a new house, then guess what you probably will do? Build a new house. So it begins in faith, but then it goes into intentions. Anthony Douglas said, when our actions are based on good intentions, our soul has no regrets. So even if it doesn't turn out the way you hoped or planned or expected, you started out with good intentions. Regrets are stones that we decide. We decide. Are either pebbles or boulders. We decide whether our regrets are obstacles to overcome, and yes, we must overcome them. Burying them for 40 or more years doesn't help. You see, you need to learn the lessons that were inside those failures, those disappointments. Or you can do as so many do, Christians including non-Christians, you can just use those setbacks as a reason to quit. To no longer really trust the promises of God. To trust the image of God that you created. And to trust that maybe this one time God turned away on the day you were created. And so even though we think God doesn't make any junk secretly in your heart, you think God screwed up with you. You might think things like this. I, I, if I'd gotten that promotion, my life would be great now. Or you might think... My life is complete mess since I divorced three years ago. Or maybe I'm a failure since I claimed bankruptcy during the pandemic. My friends, we all get knocked down. You need to let yourself be picked up through the power of the Holy Spirit who never tires of lifting us up out of the miry muck of our making or the muck that somebody in this world has thrown on you. But we all struggle with this internal conversation. Counselors call it ants. Ants, not the ones at a picnic, but automatic negative thoughts. Something happens, it happens, but you assign the value to it. You assign whether it's a pebble or a boulder. You assign motive behind it. Automatic negative thoughts. We all have them. Thinking this way creates a downward spiral. You begin to look for evidence that your negative opinion of yourself and others, of life and maybe even God, is really valid. So instead of souring on life, flip your script. Only you can do it. I can give you a peck talk on Sunday morning, but it really, the rubber hits the road on Monday. Tell yourself that you intend to do good. 
no matter what happened yesterday. Tell yourself that you intend to be good, no matter what happened yesterday. You see, new life, a new identity begins in faith. But then it continues through good intentions. James 4, 17, read it with me. If anyone knows the good they ought to do, that's an intention, by the way, and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. You need to, to know what God wants you to do. You need to intend to do it, and don't let past failures or difficulty keep you from trying again. Good intentions, agreeing with God's good plan for you, is the beginning of real change. So maybe you intend to create a thriving business and have money in the bank. No matter if you filed bankruptcy last year or not. Maybe you, you intend to treat the people around you with care and you intend to truly believe and act on that belief that you are worthy of loving and caring relationships. So you begin to set healthy boundaries where you begin to reject the messages and maybe even the people that are tearing you down and holding you back. My friends, you are worthy. You are. God doesn't make any junk and He loves you. Apply good intentions to all parts of your life and watch what happens. So the keys to changing your identity, your, your self-worth, is faith. You were created in the image of God. And intentions, knowing that your past doesn't have to define your future because you have a God that will never, ever abandon you. The last one is this. Your associations. Associations. T.F. Hodge said, what surrounds us is what is within us. Let me say that again. What surrounds us is what's within us. We're like fish. Did you know perch can live in both fresh water and salt water? But salt water fish taste what? Fishy. <laughs> fresh water fish lack that briny flavor. For those who aren't big on tasting the flavors of the ocean, you need to hang around freshwater fish. One of the things that saddened me is about my own life, and I know about other Christians, is this. That we were born into a lukewarm church, one that Revelation said God is going to spit out. And the standards of behavior in the church were no different than the standards of the culture around us. The truth is, most of us, even in our Christianity, are saltwater fish. We're briny. We have the flavors of of the ocean in us. You know, I've lost my taste for saltwater fish, for the things and values of this world. Oh yeah, you can swim either in the culture or in the Christ culture. God will love you either way, but you will taste differently. You will think differently, you will feel differently, you will talk differently, you will behave differently. Are you hearing me? I've been there. I've done that. And I am that. The Bible says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be, read with me, would you? Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And yet each of us says, oh, but not me and oh, not them. This is God's word. What you believe about God's Word will affect what you believe about yourself and about others. You can't stay at 75 degrees living a less than life if you hang around people operating at 100 degrees of what life was meant to be, the abundance in every area of your life. That's true at the gym. It's true <laughs> in your marriage. It's true in your spirituality. The people you hang around with determine what you think is normal. And maybe if you hang around with them long enough and don't spend enough time in God's Word, you'll think it's what is right. 
But God's thermostat hasn't changed from 100 degrees. You are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so am I. Consciously and unconsciously, their knowledge and their ideas became a part of who we are. You may need to say goodbye to many of your 50-degree friends. And yes, I know that's a hard thing to do. But until you clear out space in your life for the right associations, you'll be mired in relationships that have outlived their purpose. You don't need that gang you hung out with in high school if they still haven't found Christ. You don't need the people who are wondering why you read your Bible, wondering why you still go to church, why you still serve in the name of Christ. Why you're so old-fashioned and a fuddy-duddy? Why don't you get hip and go with the crowd? You see, fish and people can swim in salt water or fresh water. But what's around you does affect what's in you. Your identity is meant to be different than theirs. Now granted, we need to have unsaved friends and family, but don't forget this verse. Bad company can corrupt good character. Your identity is, by the way, different than your self-confidence. We're going to talk about that next week. Your identity is what you believe you're worth. I hope everybody in the sound of my voice thinks they're at least worth 75% of what God made you to be. That's your internal thermostat. Your self-confidence is the means to change that. So we'll talk about that one next week. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, we are going to celebrate communion together. And uh, I want you to know this. Nobody's ever out God's grace. He loves you. He's done everything he possibly can. He sent the law through Moses, and then he sent the prophets to call the wayward people back to the law. He continues to send women and men into pulpits that honor the Christ and what the Bible teaches. So God hasn't stopped calling us back to what's right, reminding us that 75, while it may feel okay, is not 100. Today in this communion time, I want you to truly release your past and to accept God's future, a future that is different than what each of us have lived, but a future that is desired. You have no idea what it's like to truly be able to sleep at night, to truly be able to get up into your day no matter what it holds, no matter what's going to happen, and trust the one who holds that day. Inside of your bulletin and on the screen is this invitation to communion. It's an open table. You don't have to be a Methodist. don't have to be a member of this church. God's grace, love, and mercy are equally available to all of us. So you may think you're the biggest sinner or the greatest saint in this room. Quite honestly, I'm more concerned about the latter than the first. Read this with me. Just listen. Christ our Lord invites this his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have, we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't know. Did we, since I did the prayer and did the other thing, did we tag anybody to do communion? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I was asleep at the switch. I'm so sorry. So would those who've been tagged to help serve communion, please come forward. <laughs> On the night in which Christ was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with 12 of his friends. And he took the institution of the Passover meal and took it to a new level, much like taking the 75 to the 100 degree mark. And he... <laughs> said to them words like this, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. I would love for you to truly take and eat of the body of Christ, to accept your identity as God's beloved son or God's beloved daughter. And after the supper, he took the cup, and again he offered thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink, remember the power of Christ. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of salvation, we come into your presence acknowledging that everything we are is from you. And all we can do is try to adjust our life, adjust our sails to reflect you and to make sure our destination is heaven and not hell. So, Father, pour out your Spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for this hurting world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. And all God's kids said, Amen. 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 All right. You know, I don't know how they did that at first supper. They didn't have this cling wrap to keep the bread fresh, but, you know, there it is. All right. And again, thank you to Mary Nordquist, who is so kind to work our altar communion table. Who's got bread? Okay. All righty, if you want to go ahead and take up a station. tell you that cellophane wrap lives up to its name cling <laughs> please come as you feel led you can come to the center or to the front of the church and just truly accept that you are a child of God created in his image that is who you are
the offerings of our heart remind us that you don't make any junk in these moments where we've contemplated who we are and who we've been. Give us the assurance that everything we need to become who you've created us to be is still there and that in Christ we will find peace. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Please rise to your feet as we conclude our worship. Oh yeah, it's supposed to be an upbeat song. I was going to wear, uh, I, it's not what's in the bulletin. I was going to wear, Lisa and I went to a country western thing last night at the Gulf Coast Symphony. Uh, no, Space Coast Symphony. i got to remember where I am. And man, they had all this great kicker music. So I hope you wore your boots and ready to put it on. Here we go. You can't sing that toe tapper and don't no 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 this isn't the valley of dead white bones that the so what I say amen you raise the roof amen 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 a couple of quick uh, next steps make sure you're aware uh, you can read as well as I can in fact some of you can read a lot better than me uh, marriage club next Saturday at the parsonage I hope some of you will come out we'll have a blast kids are welcome um, and we'll have a marriage lifter sounds good uh, Methodist men next or Saturday the 13th, which is next Saturday, right? Uh, and the women are starting again Monday night at, uh, at uh, Cindy's house, right? Okay, thanks, Nance. All right, anything else for the good of the cause? Hearing none, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> May you know that there's nothing that you've ever done that has separated you from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Choose to be close in your own mind and in your own heart. Choose to accept what Christ did and to let go of what you did. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's kids said, Amen. 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 All right, be careful out there. It's the beginning of a new week. <laughs>